time become death, the destroyer of worlds. You might already recognize those as the immortal words of American theoretical physicist J. Robert Oppenheimer, creator of the world's first nuclear bomb, as he soberly reflected on what he'd done. His words are seen as a slight mistranslation of a verse from the Bhagavad Gita, one of the central texts in Hinduism. The Gita is part of an enormous ancient poem, roughly ten times the length of the Iliad and the Odyssey combined. And yet the line quoted by Oppenheimer is one of the most renowned, although his employment of it remains a source of some dispute today. There are those who argue that the quote was a nod to a sense of duty, given the context in which it appears in the Hindu scripture and the importance of the Manhattan Project to the US war effort. But others, probably most, conclude that these were the words of a dejected man who'd realized the enormity of his creation and the untold amounts of horrible deaths that would result from it. The atomic bomb was soon put to brutal use by the US Air Force, bringing the fury of the destroyer of worlds upon Nagasaki and Hiroshima, crushing Imperial Japan's stubborn resistance and dragging the Second World War to an inglorious close in August 1945. Oppenheimer was not wrong about the destructive power of the bomb, and curiously, its power has affected the lives of not only the people unfortunate enough to inhabit those Japanese cities, but even some residing right there in the United States where it was produced. Quote, I don't believe St. Louis is a safe place to live. Everybody on this street has a tumor. End quote. An equally sobering statement, but these, unsurprisingly, did not belong to Oppenheimer. They belonged to Linda Maurice, an American woman who had moved to the city of St. Louis, Missouri as a child in the 1950s. Maurice was quoting her uncle, a physician, and what he had told her following the death of her mother from lymphoma, a type of blood cancer. Linda's father and brother died of the very same disease, and her husband, a native of the same area, was also treated for cancer in his lifetime. That area was the banks of Coldwater Creek, a stream which runs from a spring in St. Louis through most of the city's northern districts and beneath the international airport before feeding into the Missouri River. The creek is known to be contaminated with radioactive waste, something now believed to be linked to the kind of illnesses suffered by the Maurice family and many like them. Unfortunately, the area was only declared hazardous in 1989, meaning that locals like Linda, those who'd grown up nearby and regularly played in the creek as children in the 60s and 70s, were likely exposed to high levels of radiation without even being aware of it. And while greater awareness has since resulted in efforts to clean up the contamination, Coldwater Creek remains hazardous to this day, and it isn't exactly clear when it's going to be free of this pollution. Now you might say, well, what does all of this have to do with J. Robert Oppenheimer and the Manhattan Project? After all, while the project's architects were keenly aware of its destructive effects on human life, it wasn't like they had the locals of the state of Missouri in their sides when rolling it out. Testing for the weapon took place almost a thousand miles away in the arid expanses of New Mexico. So there really was no chance that Coldwater Creek's contamination stemmed directly from the first successful nuclear bomb detonation, the Trinity Test in July 1945. But actually it did. Because although it wasn't Trinity or any of the subsequent test explosions themselves which caused the heightened radiation in the area, it was instead with the industrial work that just happened to make the nuclear bomb possible and which just happened to take place right there in northern St. Louis. You see, to construct a nuclear bomb requires the use of a so-called fissile material, the most common of which is uranium, which the US Army Corps of Engineers bought up in bulk for the Manhattan Project in the 1940s. While not a common resource, uranium proved not all that hard for the US government to come by. At the time, its largest known reserves were found in nearby Canada, which would supply the resource to its ally for the right reasons, and in Belgium run Congo, which would supply the resource to anyone. For the right price. But securing uranium was only half the task. You see, uranium is mostly composed of the isotopes uranium-238 and uranium-235. After having been taken from the ground as uranium ore and refined to remove rocks and impurities, the material is made into a uranium oxide powder, commonly referred to as yellow cake. But yellow cake is composed of around 99% uranium-238, a fertile isotope, which means that it cannot be easily split by neutrons and making it more or less useless for nuclear engineering. Uranium-235, on the other hand, is easily split by neutrons, making it fissile and the golden ticket for nuclear engineering. Only a 3-5% concentration of 235 is enough to turn uranium into nuclear fuel capable of running a power plant. 
Anything with a concentration of 20% or over would be classified as highly enriched. But what was on the call sheet for Oppenheimer & Co. in the mid-1940s was uranium enriched all the way up to 90%. Basically, the team at Los Alamos needed someone to ratchet up the concentration of isotope 235 in their yellow cake to bring it to the required destroyer of worlds category. And step forward, Mallinckrodt Chemical Works. Mallinckrodt was, and is, a St. Louis pharmaceutical company which owes its name to its founders, a group of brothers who'd immigrated to the US, ironically from none other than Germany. In 1942, Edward Mallinckrodt Jr. was approached by the Manhattan Project with the task of enriching its uranium with the aim of aiding the war effort against Germany, although this ultimately wasn't how the bomb was deployed. The company set to work processing uranium at its factory in St. Louis and helped facilitate nuclear testing and bring an end to the war. However, it was this same role which caused the environmental disaster that unfolded in the area in the following decades. You see, nuclear debris, like uranium, cannot be simply discarded like common waste. Spent fuels, especially high-level waste like nuclear reactor fuel and especially weapons-grade uranium, need to be stored away and cooled for years before they could be safely disposed of. But this wasn't always what happened. The Soviet Union, for example, built its first nuclear reactor in 1946 and went on to demonstrate exactly how not to handle nuclear waste responsibly. Either it kept its nuclear debris in unsafe storage, which led to the Mag plant in Siberia blowing up in 1957, or it just chucked nuclear detritus into places like Lake Karache, thereby creating one of the most toxic bodies of water on Earth. Laboratories in the US were generally more responsible than this, but perhaps not that much more responsible. Nearby the Mallinckrodt facility lay a landfill known as Westlake. Westlake was an enormous limestone quarry, 200 acres of which were repurposed in 1962 as an open-air bin for municipal waste and construction debris. With time, it was here that some of the nuclear waste produced at the Mallinckrodt plant would wind up, mixed in with other types of municipal garbage which sounds like a brilliant idea. In the meantime, the company wound down its uranium operations in St. Louis. Processing ops were shifted to a new site in the suburb of Weldon Spring, and in 1966, they ceased entirely as what had become a toxic nuclear arms race between the US and its one-time Soviet ally de-escalated, at least officially. The Weldon Spring plant closed, and no more nightmare fuel was produced in Missouri by Mallinckrodt, who returned their focus to the much more virtuous pharmaceuticals industry. <laughs> All was well once more. Except, it wasn't. You see, while uranium and its residues were no longer being actively produced, that didn't mean that they had just gone away, did it? Now, you might recall how nuclear waste takes a really long cooling period before it can be shifted or safely disposed of. Well, initially, that waste was kept for years in storage facilities like the St. Louis Airport Storage Site, better known by its acronym, SLAPS. By now, of course, Mallinckrodt was no longer producing uranium, but the volume of refuse it had generated during its two-decade stint in the game lingered in storage, its volume simply staggering. A waste inventory by the Atomic Energy Commission in 1965 found no less than 121,000 tons of uranium residues at slabs, located only 15 miles away from downtown St. Louis. The cooling waste soon proved too large in volume for the facility, and Slaps was closed in 1966. The landfill contents were sold and handled by the Cotter Corporation, a uranium mining and milling company. And they handled them atrociously. First, the residues were moved into another storage facility around half a mile away on Lattie Avenue. The waste was improperly stored there, resulting in the continued dripping of radioactive material over years into the nearby Coldwater Creek, which carried it further through North St. Louis County and contaminated much of the surrounding area. Eventually, most of the waste was shipped out of sight to Cannon City in Colorado, where it was again found to have been mishandled, with traces of radiation later discovered in the Arkansas River. But back in St. Louis, Cotter's subcontractors still had to figure out what to do with the 8,000 tons that remained in Mallinckrodt's nuclear sludge. So they mixed the residue with topsoil, and the toxic cocktail found its way into the Westlake landfill. By now, the uranium residues were old but they still contained radioactive sediments like thorium-230, which over time began to seep out of the rotting mess. And the sorry story, it continued to get worse. Although the landfill stopped receiving municipal waste in 1973, the debris continued oozing into Coldwater Creek, poisoning its thin flow of water and exposing nearby residents, including children who sometimes swam in the creek, to dangerous levels of radiation. None of this was known to anyone. 
The Atomic Energy Commission hadn't bothered to publicly reveal the size of St. Louis's uranium residue deposits, and COD Corporation's dumping of radioactive waste at Westlake was, perhaps unsurprisingly, completely illegal. What? But it would take many more years before any of this was revealed. By the late 1970s, the Cold War was beginning to wane in intensity, and the nuclear arms race dulled alongside it. But in the US, a discovery was made that would bring the tests and St. Louis's role in them straight back into focus. All the way up in the state of New York, the residents of a Niagara Falls neighborhood called Love Canal began noticing strange smells in an area revealed to have been a dumping ground for chemical waste. More troublingly, children develop burns after playing outside, and increased levels of miscarriages, birth defects, and illnesses were being reported in the locality. A succession of investigative reports confirmed that hazardous chemicals, such as dioxins and chlorinated hydrocarbons, were leaking into the soil and groundwater, which was finding its way into some residents' basements. Then transpired that a chemical company had illegally dumped 21,000 tons of waste at the site over decades before going defunct in 1968, almost a decade before their malevolence was discovered. The Love Canal scandal led to US President Jimmy Carter expanding the competence of the Environmental Protection Agency, which had been established a few years before at the beginning of the 70s. In 1980, the Superfund program was introduced, which empowered the agency to identify abandoned or poorly contained hazardous waste sites and make those responsible for the pollution pay for the cleanup. The first Superfund list of more than 400 sites was published in 1983, mostly identifying places victim to chemical or other corporate-produced contamination and in need of dramatic corrective action. Homes and streets in places like Love Canal were demolished, and the entire population of Times Beach, Missouri, ironically less than 30 miles from Westlake, were evacuated. Attention now turned towards the hazards of nuclear engineering, something no doubt helped by a near meltdown at Pennsylvania's Three Mile Island nuclear generating station in 1979. The US government introduced the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, an independent public health agency established after the Atomic Energy Commission had been dissolved in 1975. The NRC was tasked with various functions, including overseeing reactor safety and security and managing the storage and disposal of spent nuclear fuel. The timing of all of this proved significant because in St. Louis, questions were beginning to be asked about the former Malincroc uranium processing plant, a place which few would forget had helped in the development of the nuclear bomb almost half a century before. Already by the end of the 1970s, the Missouri Department of Natural Resources had identified strange materials in the waste at Westlake. Shortly after the Three Mile Island accident, the EPA and the NRC took a keener interest in the landfill and confirmed that multiple radioactive isotopes were present in the landfill's rotting waste. The ramifications of all of this began to unravel, as in 1981, on its list of 34 most polluted waterways in the entire United States, signaled as needing, quote, cleaning beyond a specific legal requirement to protect human health, end quote. However, the EPA stopped short of identifying Coldwater Creek as a Superfund site for the time being. Ironically, a location that did become one was Cannon City, Colorado, where the majority of St. Louis's nuclear waste had wound up on Cotter's Watch in the 1960s. But although Superfund status had eluded it, at least a problem had been identified in St. Louis so authorities could get to work righting past wrongs and seeing to it that the contamination would be remedied. So, was it? No. No, it wasn't. Despite the red flags, no major steps were taken to remedy the environmental mess in the early part of the 1980s. It wasn't until late in the decade that the theme gained pace, possibly due to yet another disastrous event, the latest in a long line of Soviet nuclear mishaps. If the danger of nuclear energy was not made clear by Oppenheimer in 1945 and somehow remained unclear through a near meltdown at Three Mile Island in 1979, they were made abundantly clear by a bona fide meltdown at the Chernobyl nuclear power plant in 1986. The disaster caused chaos, mass radiation poisoning, economic turmoil, a massive international embarrassment for the Soviet Union, and indeed hastened its collapse only a few years later. Whether or not it was this that spurred the government to take action, the NRC soon published an investigative report into the Westlake landfill based on a series of radiological site surveys. The 1988 report revealed that no less than 43,000 tons of radioactively contaminated soil had been dumped into the landfill in 1973, more than was previously thought. 
It was also shown that the disposer was not authorized and that state officials had been unaware of all of this because Westlake was not even regulated at the time. The report also revealed that the deposits had been covered by only three feet of healthy soil and that contaminated soil was actually exposed to some parts of the landfill, and it also found that, quote, some low-level contamination of the groundwater is occurring, indicating that the groundwater in the vicinity is not adequately protected by the present disposition of the wastes, end quote. Amid the fallout from the report, the EPA proposed making Westlake a Superfund, and it officially received the designation in August 1990. Since Superfund status came with the need to identify those responsible for the contamination, the EPA listed no less than four. The Cot Corporation, two local waste management companies, and the US Department of Energy. Finally, the hazards of the area were known, and the government immediately sprang into action to begin sanitization and free the area from any lingering risks. <laughs> but no, 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 it's not what happened, is it? In fact, the entire decade post-1990 was devoted simply to further study of the area and risk assessment, rather than any actual cleanup. No soil removal, no engineering controls, no rezoning, no quarantines. The objective was just to gather data with the aim of eventually selecting a remedy. And this for more than 10 years. By now, people were starting to get sick. Children who'd grown up alongside Coldwater Creek in the districts nearby Westlake were now adults and were beginning to display unusually high rates of rare cancers, autoimmune diseases, and other illnesses. A website called Coldwater Creek Facts published data identifying almost 2,000 documented cases of cancer in the area nearby the stream, including more than 300 thyroid cancer cases and 448 cases of autoimmune disease. The trouble is, this still didn't make Westlake and Coldwater Creek clear-cut hazards like other Superfund sites. High rates of cancer in the area were troubling, but could not be immediately tied back to nuclear misadventure. It just didn't hold up as a clear symptom of a problem unlike in Love Canal, where children had been venturing out of their homes and returning with chemical burns. Sicknesses like cancer could be linked to various other environmental factors and lifestyle choices, and the government wasn't just going to kickstart compensation and health packages without being strong-armed into doing so. It would require further painstaking studies to display the severity of the problem. A 2008 decision was announced to place a cover over the most volatile areas of the landfill. But another problem soon emerged. You see, Westlake Landfill was now on fire. Yep, in 2010, it was discovered that the giant pit filled with some of the most toxic substances known to man was suffering a subsurface smoldering event, a type of high temperature chemical reaction resulting in continuous burning and ferocious odors. At the time of writing, 15 years later, the fire has not ceased, smoldering ominously close to the segments of the former landfill filled with old nuclear waste products. All of this, understandably, has done little to remedy the health concerns of locals, by now subject to an unholy trifecta of polluted water, airborne contaminants, and a toxic garbage heap that is on fire. But all of this did at least keep media attention on the environmental disaster, and reports regarding the rates of cancer and the government cover-ups began to proliferate in the late 2010s. Local pressure groups also formed to encourage the government to take action, and a cacophony of voices criticizing government inaction over Westlake reached crescendo. In 2018, the EPA announced a revised cleanup plan for Westlake, which it proudly announced would cost $30 million, less than a previous proposal, and it would take roughly three years to execute. This failed to materialize, and the bizarre limbo continued further. The Westlake story has since continued, becoming a lingering shame for the US government and its subsidiaries. In 2024, Reuters published an investigative hit piece going into lengthy detail about the saturation of cancer cases in Spanish Village, a district nearby the landfill. A Harvard study estimated that children residing near the creek showed a 44% higher chance of getting cancer than a control population, including a five-fold higher likelihood of thyroid cancer. Other publications interviewed residents who described their entire neighborhoods being decimated by the disease, and CBS interviewed a local activist who described having pushed for the remaining waste to be removed for more than 12 years, during which time she'd undergone a full hysterectomy and been diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Yet still, the smoldering fire burns on. The Army Corps of Engineers eventually commented that a review would be published before the end of 2025. Otherwise, the site remains on track to have its cleanup completed in 2038. Thank you for watching.